Today is our opportunity to talk with uh, Police Chief Livingstone, who has been with the town for a very long time and has seen a lot of things. So I'm really eager to hear the types of things that he has to say. I want to give you a brief um, update on what's going on team with us right now. Uh, as of yesterday, we have uh, 26,867 total cases of COVID-19 that have been diagnosed and or tested. Uh, 224 of those are in Hampshire County and 11 cases are in the town of Amherst. Um, as of yesterday, there are 844 deaths in Massachusetts and there have been 122,049 uh, tests that have been uh, taken, have been given so far. And so that's one of the things that the state is trying to do and they're doing, uh, every day we see additional progress in, in um, getting more testing sites, uh, prioritizing tests for people who are first responders, people who are on the front lines, the workers, things like that, especially prioritizing uh, quick tests for them so that they can find out right away if they have been, if they are uh, subject to COVID-19 or not. Um, so governor has come out with uh, a number of things um, that, um, guidance documents that we have then translated for our our community. The big ones that we did this week and yesterday were guidance for construction sites. Um, and these guidance, there are guidance and rules, but there were guidance from our uh, inspection services department have been sent to anybody who had taken out a building permit in the last three months, plus they're included with any kind of um, building permit that's issued subsequent to that. We also have guidance for grocery stores. The state has put a maximum limit, limit on it, um, occupancy of, of, of grocery stores at 40% of, um, of the typical occupancy. And so we're informing the grocery store so they're aware of that. Uh, we also have given some guidance to um, encouraging them to do curbside pickup as opposed to you know, having people come into their places of, of business. Um, and we're, we're coming out soon this week with more um, guidance for other retail establishments. Um, one of the things that we talk about, and this is before I transition over to, to Chief Livingstone, um, we meet pretty much every day with the, the police chief, the fire chief, the health director, uh, as, a, as the leads of this with the DPW superintendent, the finance director, assistant town manager too. Um, go over where we are uh, in terms of if there had been any incidents, what's the status of our employees, is everybody health, healthy, um, have there been any incidents with our employees, or are we, are we fully staffed and able to respond to any kind of emergencies. So we do that on a daily basis and then review topics that have come up. Um, I can sort of alert you that coming forward, um, uh, we'll, we will be talking a lot more about budget we had been talking about just response and making sure our, our first responders are um, outfitted with the right PPE, um, personal protection equipment. Um, but coming, you know, going forward over the next few weeks, you'll hear a lot about budgets and things like that. So um, that is going to be a major um, topic of conversation with the library trustees, the school committee, of course, the town council. So as I talked about um, our, COVID response team, you know, <clears throat> many, many employees are contributing to this and I think the police are on the front lines. And so I'd like to just lift uh, Scott Livingstone, our police chief, um, has anything that he wants to start off with. How's your, how's your, I guess the first question is, how's the department doing? You know, are you guys ready to handle anything that comes down the road? You know, thanks, thanks Paul. Um, and first and foremost, yes, we are um, uh, a very healthy agency right now. Uh, we have nobody out, uh, either sick or with any symptoms currently, both in police and fire, I mean, excuse me, police and dispatch. So from that perspective, things are going very well. The officers are adhering to all of the recommendations that come through our, our local health department, who we work very closely with and all of the um, recommendations from CDC and the state government as well. So we're in a good um, position that way. We have all the equipment that we need as far as PPEs um, and the officers are well versed in 
and um, you know how to respond to calls and, and protect themselves as well as the public. So I'm um, really good shape as far as that's concerned. Thanks. Great. I'm going to just take a quick chance to remind attendees how they can ask a question using the Q&A button in the Zoom application or by raising your hand in Zoom, star nine for those of you on the phone. Um, we did have a couple of questions come through earlier that, um, that are for the chief, so I can, sure. I can launch into some of those if you guys would like. Sure. Sounds good. So some of that you just, uh, you just covered in your statement there. But we have someone asking, are, are you still going into people's homes? Um, and what are the, the major impacts to your operations or changes that have happened? So sure, uh, that is one of the, you know, when we, when we di decided how we were going to respond to types of calls, uh, certainly things that we took into consideration is A, are there certain calls that we can no longer respond to? And by that, um, you know, we looked at our medical calls, uh, Typically, pre-C-19, we would respond to almost all of the medical calls with the fire department. So we've had to revisit that and see which types of calls we could cut back on, and we've done that. Um, you know, if there's an emergency situation, uh, we would still respond to those. But your general, um, you know, if somebody's got a cough, if somebody's not feeling well, we wouldn't respond to those necessarily. But if an individual obviously injures themselves at home, falls, breaks, a leg or has a heart attack, we are certainly responding to those and we would own the protective equipment that we have issued to us. Um, specifically, people's homes, we try and limit that. Um, if it's something where they want to report, uh, let's say for instance, a larceny, we would ask that they step outside and interact with the officers in a safe distance, you know, the six to eight foot range and we can still, you know, take the information we need to file reports that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we've really kind of had to change the way we've, we've uh, operated as an agency because we were so very, uh, our philosophy was always about community policing and community outreach. And we've certainly had to change that. Um, and it's, it's taken the officers getting some used to because it's kind of the opposite of how we operate as an agency. So it's been getting a little bit weird, a little bit, you know, <laughs> getting used to uh, dealing with people from a distance, I guess, so. I, I noticed you call it C-19, is that, that's, I call it COVID-19 or coronavirus, but yeah. at least work, is it C-19? Is that how you reference it? It's, a, yeah, it's shortening things up for sure. Um, you know, uh, it's just a term that somebody started using in the agency and I think it's stuck, so. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We have another question here for the, for the chief. Um, they say they see people gathering in groups from time to time, and it may, uh, may not be more than 10 people, but they worry that not everyone is taking the stay home order seriously, and they wonder what they should do when they see something like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll respond to um, the people are really concerned and, and call, we'll, we'll certainly respond if they want us to. Um, I think for the most part, we'll take it on a case by case basis. So if it's a you know, group of young college age people are hanging out, let's say uh, five or six of them in a fire pit and they're not adhering to the social distancing part. We, we will certainly go there and remind them of that. Um, but to just generally getting calls about, hey, I've seen this group, you know, we would discourage people from just calling in indiscriminately um, because what we were seeing is people would be driving by a location, for instance, and then try and report something to us. And, you know, the information gets kind of clouded and, you know, sometimes we didn't know where we were responding to or what we were responding to. So if there are very specifics that somebody wanted us to respond to, you know, we would certainly still do that. Great. Um, so, so something that came up um, last night, I think, uh, was about the notch and uh, yes. whether that was open for people to park there. And is that... Uh, Explain, it, how, is that something that you would respond to or what is, what's the rules around the notch in the visitor center there? Yeah, so a couple of things, like we, as I mentioned, um, we had a call come in from a passerby maybe a week and a half ago or maybe two weeks ago even, where they said, hey, there are a lot of people hanging out in the parking lot, probably preparing to go for a hike. That's not something we would typically want to respond to. Um, it, it's just too general. Uh, 
for an officer to be going up there and trying to decide who's in violation or who's not. And then we received further information from the, um, the state DCR that they're actually going to close that parking lot down this past weekend. And, um, you know, we had conversations with um, how that would be regulated, and how officers could re possibly respond to something of that nature. Um, the biggest problem we had from the Amherst police perspective is we don't have jurisdiction over the street over 116 in that location and the, the you know the parking lot is included in that so if we were to go up there and trying to enforce parking regulations we really don't have the authority to do that that would fall on the state's um, jurisdiction and that was one of the things that we tried to um, speak to the DCR people about is if there are violations, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place about how to enforce that. Um, because we envisioned if they closed the parking lot that people would start parking in the streets and that would become even more of a hazard than if people had just had the um, parking lot, access to the parking lot in order to go on their hikes. So as it turns out, I did take a ride up there on Saturday morning and saw that they must have changed their minds um, and decided not to close that parking lot which I think was a good thing, so. This question's kind of related. So um, with warmer weather getting mm -hmm. here, eventually, uh, do you worry about big parties like happens in most springs in town? And, and if so, how will you handle that? Sure, so um, I don't know if worried's the uh, right, we are certainly have discussions and it's something that police officers themselves um, talk about frequently. Um, what we have learned, and we, we have a close relationship with most of our landlords, um, a large portion of our young people have gone home. Uh, we kind of anticipated after spring break that a lot of them were going to stay in town in their rented apartments and, and do their distance learning from their own apartments. And it doesn't seem like that's the case, uh, at least not as many as we thought we might see. So um, are we concerned about large gatherings? Yes worried about them, maybe not so much, but what we'll do is we'll handle those on a case-by-case -case basis as well. We, we flat out don't want people ha hanging out in large groups, you know, just having drinking parties. That goes against every regulation that's coming out from our local health director, the state and the CDC people. So we, we, would, we would approach those people and, and ask that they disperse. Um, so, you know, we will frown upon any large gatherings of that. Uh, with just the idea of partying in mind, yes. Great, thank you. Yeah. We have another question here uh, regarding downtown. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the caller says that they've been downtown the other day and it looks pretty vacant and quiet. You know, a lot of businesses might have um, closed their doors for now. And they're wondering if the police department are doing anything to protect the closed businesses um, downtown. Sure. So we are, and um, you know, that's absolutely true uh, downtown. And I walk through downtown just about every day myself during the daylight hours. And um, it is pretty sad um, because it's always such a, a vibrant and, and busy downtown. But it's, uh, it was one of our you know, biggest concerns. Uh, my staff and I spoke about it. And uh, you know, the first things we decided is that with each shift now, Officers will be responsible for going around and actually checking doorknobs and um, going old school where we used to have an officer do center checks and that's what we're doing now. And, you know, we were able to uh, find a few open doors and notify the uh, business owners and they're very appreciative of that. And we've also had to make, unfortunately, had to make an arrest in the downtown business from a break-in that had occurred. So, um, you know, but we are out there uh, on every ship checking businesses to make sure that they're you know, yeah, they're protected. Paul, did you have anything to add um, on the local business front? Sure. Um, so yeah, um, we have had, we're in regular touch with the Business Improvement District and with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, meeting weekly with them to talk about the future of downtown, uh, talk about the businesses that are struggling and trying to do everything we can to help them survive this uh, this this drought and um, hoping that there are, that as many of them as possible will come back. I think one of the challenges for a lot of small businesses is that they work on very narrow margins 
And that's not, there's no different in our community as well. We have had some landlords who have been really generous about forgiving rent or delaying rent payments for several months. So that's a really important thing for our um, local businesses. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to do as much, you know, whenever I can go and buy things, um, you know, take out meals and things like that, just to help help them get through this very, very difficult time. But the unfortunate thing is that when, for restaurants especially, we're a restaurant-dependent economy. Mm. When we come out of this, no one's going to go and buy two dinners. Uh, they, they might go back to the restaurant, but things will fundamentally change because they may not be able to have as many tables. And they may not be, have as many people as closely um, in, in a space. So we don't know what that future looks like. And um, but we, we believe that um, our... The, you know, we have really good foundation in terms of we are a, 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 an attractive community where people want to live. Um, we have the university and the two colleges here that has a, has a ready employment base. But we think we will be poised to come back and we want to be ready to, um, to get a jump running start when we do come back. So. Great. Thank you. I have a, another question for the chief because I, if I remember correctly, you've been in Amherst for a, a big part, a big part of your career. We'll say, um, have you ever There's seen a- anything like this in Amherst or anything that you can recall that was similar? Yeah. So I have been in Amherst as a police officer for 40 years, um, which is a long time. And I like to joke that I started when I was three years old. So, <laughs> but um, you know, nothing even close. I mean, I was I was a beat officer in 1978 when we had the blizzard and where we got four or five feet of snow, and for a couple of days, you know, nobody was make, moving around except for police and fire for the most part, and we had to respond to calls with plow trucks, that sort of thing. But um, you know, nothing to this magnitude. This is just uh, unprecedented and unusual, and um, you know, just how we have to change, how we respond to calls and just all the protections that are in place. This is uh, unbelievable, really. Um, And I guess the eerie thing is nobody quite knows when it'll get back to normal. Mm -hmm. That's another part of the the whole weirdness of it, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting when you talk about that, uh, Chief, we keep thinking about, well, how is this gonna change the way we do business? So right now we're having all of our committee meetings uh, on Zoom or something like that and, or, uh, and um, doing a lot of meetings remotely through Microsoft Teams. Um, yeah. And I wonder, I, I, we start to speculate, is that going to be the new normal? Or are, we going to, or are we going to go back to just how we've always done things? I would guess that for police and fire, you're less susceptible to different things because what your business is about is responding when people call and showing right. up present you can't zoom into a house if there's a you know a complaint coming from somebody of a burglar or their fear of a burglar or something like that and i think the training what i've always been impressed by your department is the level of training that you have given to, that you've made sure all of your officers get and just seen it in action with when how they handle very difficult challenging things like domestic violence things or yeah. people experiencing homelessness who might be mentally as well um but do you see any sub, uh, substantial difference that will stick on how you're doing things now? You know, I, I hope not because, you know, and it's funny, funny, not funny, but the police officers themselves don't really like the way that we have to ra- respond and inter- interact with people. And the best way I can, the best description I can give is that, you know, we, we had a um, software um, that we used in order to let um, the citizens report little things online, like, for instance, small larcenies you could report online, like if your bike was stolen or something was stolen out of your yard. And it was the officers themselves who said, you know, we, we'd rather just go to the house and talk to the people about little things like that. So, you know, it, it was interesting to hear the officers themselves say, you know, they don't really like this way of doing police. And, um, they're hoping that it doesn't last much longer. It's the face-to-face interactions that police officers have with the public means something to them. And I'm talking most of the time, it's very positive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you know, that 
we hope that it's not going to be the new norm, um, that this is the way we're going to be doing normal business. It's interesting you say that because uh, when we interview new police officers, one of the questions we have is, if you came to work here and wanted to just respond to a call every every once in a while, this is not the department for you. you right. This is a very big department. And we get people who want to be doing police work actively and have a broad array of different police work that they have ability from sort of, you know, broken window type things to um, high level things. And I think that's the type of officer that we, we recruit and it comes here. And, um, and so I, I can imagine how that is just, you know, they might, I'm not saying they're bored, but that there's just not enough activity for them. And, and that person to person activity is what drives them. Yeah, and they're bored. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and we, because we encourage the officers, yeah, especially now, um, and there are so, so few calls where like, you know, you need to be out in public, you need to be seen, you need to be interacting with people when you can and where you can. And, you know, we didn't have to tell them that twice, that's for sure. Um, you know, they, they want to be out and about and seeing people. And, and trying to reassure them that things are going to get better and uh, the community is still, still safe, and, but we're there if you need us. Great. All right. Well, I do not have any other questions that were submitted. Um, do you guys have any parting statements that you'd like to um, leave our viewers with? Chief? No, I think uh, thanks for the opportunity, um, Paul and Brianna, for this. I think it's great that the public gets an opportunity to see this and be involved in this and um, you know I would just add that if people need us we're, we are there for them and we'll get through this together uh, uh, we have a great great community the town of Amherst um, and we, you know I'm sure we'll get through this with flying colors so. and I, I just like to add that how much I appreciate the support of the community the broader community and the town council um, it's it's a really hard time to be um, an elected official, I think, and, and trying to figure out what's, what's the right thing to do. And I think they've done a really marvelous job at, try, at hitting right, the right notes at the right time. And I also just, the general public has been so supportive and thankful for the work that everybody in the town is doing. So yeah. really appreciate that. It really matters to us. Right? Absolutely. Well, I, I do want to thank um, Police Chief Scott Livingstone for joining us today. If you have any follow-up questions, you can email us at info at amherstma.gov. We will be doing this every Tuesday and Thursday for the next couple of weeks at noon. So um, if you didn't get a chance to ask all your questions today, please feel free, free to join us on Thursday. We'll have um, school superintendent, Dr. Michael Morris with us, as well as health director, Julie Fetterman and town manager, Paul Balkerman. I just wanna thank everybody for tuning in and uh, we will chat with you soon. Great. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you.